Contextualizing. The Frederick van Salzabert Institute um, promotes critical thinking on campus, divestment, and our collective human reaction to the all encompassing social issue of climate change requires a fair amount of critical thinking. So that's what, what we are here to do today. I'm sure you have read their bios and know full well who they are, but I'll quickly summarize some of the key points again. Professor Guy Mitchley is an internationally acknowledged expert in the field of biodiversity and global change science. And just to base my claim on some facts, as we aim to do here precisely by his presence, he was included as one of six South African scientists in the Thomson Reuters list of most influential contemporary researchers in their fields of expertise last year. Apart from that, he was part of a team um, who shared the Nobel Peace Prize for promote for producing a climate change assessment document for the, for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. His academic work has been cited more than 12,000 times. May is the executive director of 350.org, a global organization of which we have some South African rep representatives here today. Welcome. 350.org's uh, main mandate is to drive a people-led climate change movement and they are operating in 188 countries. May is, from the nature of a position and expertise, a world leader in the field of climate change and our response to it. And it's not only us who are privileged, from what I gather, they were also quite excited to meet each other. But just a quick word on divestment. Thus far, 28 universities have committed themselves to the fossil free campaign. Oxford University has labeled it the fastest growing divestment campaign in history, referring to other similar campaigns such as the one against apartheid and tobacco. The US alone has seen a total of $50 billion divested so far, as recorded by The Guardian. The world is taking note. Shouldn't we? May will address this question in particular, but mostly this platform is here for you as students to determine the flow of the conversation by asking your questions to her. Afterwards, Stephen Myberg, who's the main driving force behind Fossil Free Stellenbosch, um, will say a few things. So stick around for that if you can. Also, please make sure to sign our attendance lists, who are, which are in circulation. But most importantly, we are very, very honored to have you here today, May. Thank you very much. And Professor Mitchley. I now ask Professor Mitchley to explain to us what the urgency of the climate change crisis is. Well, what a, what a great uh, chance to meet you, May. What an honor to speak before you. Well, <laughs> just a few key things. I'm not going to speak for very long. But um, we, just uh, about a month ago, we passed a really critical point in the Earth's history. Uh, I'm sure most of you will know what that is, right? <laughs> the CO2 level in the atmosphere finally went about 400 parts per million and stayed there for a full month. Um, that's, uh, that's quite a shocking, it's a shocking statistic. It should be a shocking statistic. I, I think a lot of us don't treat it as a shock, but I, I want to give you some, some context to let you see that this is a shock. <laughs> Why is it such a shock? Well, before we started to burn fossil fuel uh, some 150 years ago, the CO2 level was 280 parts per million. So we've increased this level by, by 40% in the space of a few centuries. Uh, some 12,000 years before that, the CO2 level was 180 parts per million. And for the last 2 million years, about 80% of the time, the CO2 level has been closer to 180 parts per million. That's less than 50% of what it is now. Uh, and the planet was about five degrees cooler than 
it was even before we be began increasing fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuel emissions. So we live on a planet that for the past two million years at least has been a cool adapted planet. And we have now increased the CO2 level to 400 ppm and we are starting to increase the temperature. The last time CO2 uh, was at 400 ppm could be several millions of years ago. And if we continue to emit foss uh, fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuel gases, it will rise to levels that the planet has not seen for between 20 and 30 million years in the space of a century. So it took 30 million years to get the CO2 down to these levels, and we're increasing it in, in less than 200. That is an ecological shock of enormous proportions that we are exposing our planet to. So when you, when you think about those long time scales and the rapid rate at which we've changed the system, you, you get a real sense of how much we are shaking it, we are shaking things around. Um, so we, we live on a cool adapted planet, we are rapidly make it, making it much warmer and we are increasing the CO2 level. We are acidifying the oceans because 25% uh, of the CO2 that we emit is absorbed into the ocean surface and gradually reduces the, uh, uh, reduces the pH of the oceans. Another 25% appears to be going into the land surface, into vegetation, so our ecosystems are adapting naturally and helping us. They're actu actually absorbing half of what we emit on average every year. Unfortunately, that free service is not as reliable as we'd like it to be. So in very warm years, like El Nino years, the land surface does not absorb that CO2 and in fact comes dangerously close to starting to emit CO2. So one of those sinks, the land sink, could become a source as temperature continues to rise. That means that we lose that natural service and we start to go into a, in, into a, a, a space where nature starts working against us rather than for us. That's a, a very frightening prospect. And it's organizations like 350.org that remind us that uh, we cannot, we cannot afford to go to those sorts of levels. So um, what I want to say is that ecosystems, I believe, will adapt. There's, uh, there's no question they will. We know that they will. We've been hit by meteorites from space. And uh, after a few million years, the world has recovered, maybe a few tens of million. But it's, it's our human systems that, are, that we think are extremely vulnerable. Our agriculture, health, our cities, uh, there's a whole range of things that we need to start really thinking about and worrying about. But we can use nature to help us adapt, but we've got to give nature a chance. And that, to me, is uh, one of the key lessons that we need to take home. And hopefully 350.org is going to get us on the path. Thanks very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and um, to be in South Africa and it's a country we've studied at 350 for many years in terms of what this country's social movement history has taught us about how to organize around the climate justice movement. So I'm very excited to be here and share a little bit about what we're seeing around the world, this movement that's really building to address exactly what the professor was just describing, which is a, a truly planetary emergency. And it's, it's a rare privilege for me to share the stage with a scientist, so thank you. Um, before I speak, I want to introduce my colleague, Komonso, who is organizing with us throughout the country. And since I'm only here today, um, I, and I hope as a result of this talk, there's more interest in staying involved, um, I want you all to get to know Komonso because he will be someone you can work with moving forward. So he's going to say a bit about our work here and then I will come back and share a little bit about the, the global perspective and the divestment movement in particular. So thank you. I'll be back then. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that was good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Mera, does that work? <laughs> cool. Um, I think May just asked me to speak so that I can greet 
in a local language, so I just did that and made just head down. <laughs> That's not the case. Guys, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much for um, hosting us. Thanks to the team at the Institute. Um, so immediately, thank you very much for agreeing to speak. Stephen and the team that has been organizing this, we're very, very happy to be here. I'm, I'm quickly gonna give just a, big, a bit of background to what we do. Um, so some would know about 350, but not as many people would know. Um, and essentially, 350 is a climate change campaign, um, working with multiple communities. It obviously started in the US. Um, I think we are very lucky to have May here. <coughs> She's part of the team that started the movement. Um, and interesting, being here, I was, I just, I was listening to the studio and myself, um, and the constant question in my mind, um, and certainly in the team's mind, has always been, what is the youth's uh, response? What is the youth's role when it comes to pertinent social issues? I think as a country, we would know very well as to what has the youth been able to achieve in this country. And climate change at this point and its effects, um, especially for our continent, is most probably one of the biggest challenges that we are facing. And the obvious question is, what is there to be done? Um, and part of the reason why we're here is just to start that conversation. Luckily, we have uh, May who give the background to where it all started. But the point is that um, this is the start of a bigger journey that we are looking at um, embarking on uh, with the students here and maybe give that, that effect. I'm glad that uh, Professor Mitchell just gave the background to the science behind it. At the previous engagements, I had to try and give the science behind it, which is not something that I'm as good at, so I'm just wearing my activist hat now and my youthful hat to say that I'm raising my hand and hopefully a few more students at Stellenbosch will raise their hands to and we fight this challenge. It's ours after all. Um, if we don't deal with it now, it will get worse. Um, just to pick up on that one part to say that the concentration of carbon dioxide at this point sits at 400 parts per million. Um, and, and this is partly why we are called 350. Um, 350 is that concentration of carbon dioxide that you can have a relatively livable planet. But if we continue at this rate, the question is how hard will it hit the world? And more specifically, how hard will it hit our part of the world? We've seen this recently with um, floods in Malawi, in uh, Mozambique. 2014 was considered the hottest year in, our, in the history of, of um, human beings. Um, and, and, and these are likely to just go on. If we start now um, speaking towards these things, it's not only limited to what's happening in, in, in university. Um, as, as May will speak a lot more about the divestment campaign that we've been running. But from a student perspective, there's, there's a number of campaigns and we can surely lend a huge voice towards this campaign. Um, there's been a huge momentum that has been growing with it, um, but I'll leave this part for me to just engage on. I mean, why would Kumoso go on and on about the investment if we have the pleasure of listening to <laughs> May? Enjoy, guys. start at the beginning, which is how did this whole thing get started? And you've just heard about what 350 actually means, but who am I? I'm only 31 years old. How did this whole effort get started? And part of what's so good about being here with all of you is that it started on a college campus, a university campus just like this. And we were learning the science. We were learning about what was happening with climate change, and we started to form a group. And slowly but surely, that group was getting our campus to change its practices, to be more sustainable as a campus. And we were starting to have some real victories. And it was, it was that process of working as students that led to now our organization, which encompasses 100 people around the world. But much more than that, it's a global network of activists and volunteers. So that's the short version. But I want to tell the slightly surprising part. Is there anyone here who's still kind of wondering, is climate change as important as all these other things that I care about? Because that was me when I was a student. When I was a student at university, I was concerned about lots and lots of things, but not necessarily environmental issues. I wanted to study global development. 
I wanted to study global health issues, global poverty, and justice. That was what inspired me. Actually, when I was a, uh, my first year at university, the US, where I am from, bombed Iraq, and I was expecting there to be some kind of major student uprising because I had read in history books that students protest. That is what students do. And at my university, this was not happening. And I thought, oh, I must be at the wrong university. <laughs> and I almost left my university, but I'm glad I did not because it was climate change that turned that around. It was students on my campus saw climate change as a way that actually connects all these other things we cared about. And I was convinced too, because when we think about what climate change does to our world, it's in many ways the greatest inequality that's ever existed. Here you have the rich getting richer, burning coal, oil, gas, these companies growing in size and profitability and climate change is affecting the people who are already the most vulnerable populations in the world and making it harder for them to live. And so this gap is just widening in our world. And if we think about, well, what, what can we do to turn inequality around? Actually tackling climate change is this enormous avenue to try and create a more equal, a more just, a more fair world. So that's what got me involved. That's what got me excited. And thankfully, the movement is growing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about divestment in just a second. But I, wa I wanna share a little bit about what we've learned just in the past year. Because if any of you are you know, coming into this issue relatively recently, it's actually perfect timing. Because there's been a whole shift in the way climate change is now understood. For a long time, we were debating numbers, 350, 400, for a long time, People thought that actually, and I won't go too much into the science because there's a scientist here, so I'm not really qualified, but for a long time it was thought that 400 was actually the safe level of carbon in the atmosphere. So here we come along as 350. We're 26 years old. We've just graduated from university. No one is really taking us seriously. Um, but we were debating numbers on and on and on, and we weren't getting very far. And there was a United Nations climate change conference in Copenhagen back in 2009, which we tried to influence with our number. So here we just graduated from university. We were very passionate. We organized what CNN, our major news station in the US, referred to as the largest day of political action in history on any issue on climate change. So again, as students, we had just learned in the history books that the way social change works is you organize, you have your facts, politicians act. And so here we went to the United Nations with our protests and said, okay, let's see this climate treaty. We didn't get it. And so this, this shift that I'm referring to that's happened in the past year is very important and it's actually exciting because it's starting to become understood finally that we can't burn fossil fuels anymore that coal and oil and gas, we have to actually leave those reserves underground. And I'm very aware that saying that in South Africa, where there's enormous mineral resources, might come as a little shocking as an American here. What, what am I saying? Don't touch your coal, South Africa. And the, the, the issue here is that development and climate safety have to go hand in hand. But we have to find a better way through clean energy. So that, that is the shift that's happened in the climate movement, is from thinking it was all about numbers to actually it's about the economy, it's about fossil fuels, it's about changing the way our economy works, and development too. So that's the exciting part. So I'm gonna pause here and share a little bit about how we've tried to spread this idea around the world, and how this small group that started on a university campus now includes Komotsu, Ferial, and many other people around the world. And with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we can do here on this campus to be connected to this global movement. So, here's, here's the video. Oh, wait. Come over. Um, just one bit of context. This was a video about Global Divestment Day, which happened back in February. Um, and so that's, that's what this is. Hundreds of demonstrators have rallied to pressure Australia's major banks. The time for investing in fossil fuels is over. Today, 
today's demonstration is one of hundreds taking place across the world as part of Global Divestment Day, a movement that's gained significant momentum over the past two years. It's been the fastest growing divestment campaign in history. It is grassroots driven, it is youth led, it is based on including everybody. Do you stand against what you do? Say yes! Do you stand against climate change? We are here because it takes everyone to change everything. What began as a movement on US college campuses has reached the skyscrapers of high finance. Globally, nearly 200 institutions and thousands of individuals have moved a total of $50 billion in assets away from fossil fuels. If we take our money and put it into renewables like solar panels, the world could be such a better place. So that's just to give you a bit of a flavor about here we are in Stellenbosch having this conversation, but simultaneously it's happening in many countries around the world. So this is, uh, for me, the fun part about where we talk about what can actually be done. So I really, I want to emphasize two things. One is that I want to thank the organizers of this event because you've done an incredible job bringing this group together and clearly there's a lot of energy on this campus. And it reminds me actually a lot of my campus, where campus sustainability, becoming a green campus is really important. But what more can you guys do to really make Stellenbosch University a leader? So I think you actually have a lot of people in the room who can help guide that, and I hope you will continue to work with Komotso after this. So that's number one. The second is, is to dive deep a bit into divestment. So as I was saying before about how climate change has changed as an issue, from one about numbers to one about the economy, fossil fuels, the idea of divestment is a pretty simple one. It's this idea that if it's wrong to cause climate change, which we agree that it is, it's wrong to make money off of causing climate change, which sounds pretty basic, but it, it really was not understood until quite recently, actually. And divestment is intended to try and show that, that to say, here are these companies that are burning coal, oil, and gas, it's causing climate change, it's making us sick, it's polluting our air and our water. And that money, our, our universities are actually invested in these products that are making it hard for us to even have a future. So what sense does that make as institutions of higher learning who are fundamentally about preparing all of you for the future, but the money that's helping you go to your classes is invested in fossil fuels? So that's the idea, is, is how, how do you expose that? And on, on the other hand, politically, how do you actually start to question the morality of investing in fossil fuels? And the, the whole idea for this actually came from studying South Africa and studying the anti-apartheid divestment campaign, which was a very smart way of making a moral issue and to say, well, if it's wrong, if this government's actions are wrong, I don't want my money, my retirement savings, to be invested in something that's wrong. So one of the reasons it's great to be here is actually this is the place we studied to think about the divestment campaign. So that, that's what it's about. And it's really, it's really surprised us how much it's taken off. Because just when we were starting 350, again, a few students not really taken seriously no one thought that we would succeed. And years later, with divestment, when we started to say, well, what, what, if we, what if universities started to divest? What if churches and pension funds started to divest? Everyone said, this is not going to work. Another crazy idea from 350. But we, and we've even been surprised. As you, you heard already, $50 billion of assets under management are now fossil free within one year. That was one year's worth of activity. You have HSBC, one of the largest banks, telling its clients to not invest in fossil fuels anymore. You have major asset managers like Morgan Stanley, which is based in the States, telling its in investor clients fossil fuel divestment is the number one trend to pay attention to across, across the entire economy. 
So there's all these examples from exactly what we're trying to expose that it's starting to work. And in some ways, even better than that, it's just building tons of momentum in this movement. Because I'll, I'll close with this point. It's already too late to stop climate change. We know this. That's what the 350 number means. We're, it's, we're too far. We're at 400. We've already done too much, and climate change is here to stay. It's a problem that our generation has inherited. It will be with our whole lives. Um, whew, I get choked up when I say that. Um, and since we know that, we know that we have to actually build a movement that can confront this problem because we don't have a lot of time. And the other side, these companies, will always have more money than us. We're never going to have more money than Sasol or Shell. But we do have more people. And we have our creativity and our energy and our spirit and all our ideas. And so what this is about is building momentum. So we, we've seen, I counted last night, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, almost a 1,000 divestment campaigns around the world, from churches to schools. They're everywhere. And so we're building this movement. It can be bigger. If, if we're big enough, we can actually tip that balance on our side and start to really address what is, as the professor very eloquently put it, a problem that's, a, that's a, just a huge global wake-up call. So I hope you guys will join in. I look forward to having a discussion with you. And um, we've, been, we've been traveling to a lot of places, and we were just whispering to each other, seems like there's a lot happening here at Stellenbosch. So I'm, I'm confident that next time we're back, there will be something exciting to report. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, now is your opportunity to ask questions. So please ask away. <laughs> anyway. um, I specifically want to know, you mentioned your university kind of, uh, kind of starting this whole thing there. Um, what would you recommend, what was the, like, the, the turning point at, at the university that might be perceived as being a bit apathetic towards environmental issues? What exactly do you think became, or was the turning point for that change? I love this question. Um, I think the most important thing was actually a class. A a, I mean, <coughs> an inspired professor taught a class about the climate change movement. And about 15 students took the class. And one of the projects in the class was, um, it wasn't to you know, write, a, write an assignment or take a test. It was start a group, start a climate activist group <laughs> on the campus. And so what we did is we invited the leaders of all the clubs of all on the campus to our first meeting and said, climate change unites all of our issues. Let's all work on climate change. Um, and so it was that class and that kind of initial meeting where we connected those dots um, that, that really turned it around. And then from then on, we had, and I'm not exaggerating, 100 people every week at the meetings. Um, so I guess the other piece was we had a couple of early wins and they were small. You know, we, we had the university um, commit to, this is very technical, <laughs> but turn down the temperature of all the dorms to save energy. And it was not a lot to ask, and it saved the university money. So they agreed, and we had a, we had a win. So we kept going, and we had momentum. So that, that's, what, that's what really worked. Yeah. Can I ask a political question? Um, you know, the, one of the reasons we've got some hope at the moment is because the US and China have gone into a mutual agreement to, to deal with the issue. Um, the US is, is building towards um, electing a new president in 2016. Um, <laughs> if, we, if we lose the, you know, if, if Democrats lose the presidency, the US will crush climate change action. In the UK, climate change wasn't mentioned once in the recent election. Um, Japan has pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. Canada has pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. Australia has turned back all its effort on climate change. Politically, we, we f there, 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 is a, there is a growing wave of action against climate change, a climate change response. 
So divestment is one thing, and I, I think it's brilliant, but do you see a risk uh, of a, a political shift towards the right happening, towards more inequality and um, basically disaster on the, on the horizon? Totally, yeah. So are you doing anything about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say a few things. One is that if you look at the facts on climate change, it is bad news every way you look at it. The, the, you're just sort of lying to yourself if you don't say that. But it is a choice to be hopeful about what we can do about it. Right. And it, it, it really is. I mean, it's hard to, you saw me sort of break down up here. No. Sometimes it just dawns on you just how serious it is, and it's very scary. But if we all just get too scared, um, we guarantee this outcome. So I think what, I mean, what we're trying to do about it is this idea that, uh, I'll try to be concise, it's sort of this combination of the big picture and the little picture. So by focusing on the money, not just investment, but fossil fuel subsidies, investments in renewable energy, by really making climate change an economic issue, we have a, a better chance of more people understanding how important it is to their lives. The little picture is the projects themselves. Major coal plants like Madupi, like in the US we have the Keystone Pipeline where these projects are so bad. <laughs> you know, they, they pollute the air, they pollute the water, they displace communities, and they cause climate change. Um, and they don't, they create maybe 10 jobs, you know, in, in the case of Keystone. And so by, the, by connecting the big picture and the little picture, I think it's, it's much easier to understand what can be in many ways a very technical issue, and you can lose hope. And I, I think on a more, even more practical level, at the end of this year, there's going to be another major climate summit with the UN in Paris. And we have a very different view going into Paris than we did going into Copenhagen in 2009, which is that in 2009, it was all about countries and individual country actions. And what that meant is everyone sort of ignored the role of the fossil fuel sector, which in many cases is influencing the politics. But it, I would say in every case, it's influencing the politics. And what's changed since 2009 is that shift. And now it's impossible to talk about climate negotiations without talking about Shell and coal companies and BP Billiton. Um, and so, that's been important because what we'll be able to see in Paris is we'll be able to actually mark our own progress and understand what we need to do. Because in a, in a lot of, this may sound odd, but I think with a lot of questions about organizing and mobilization, sometimes it is confusing what you need to do. The strategy is, is sort of murky. And with climate change, it's, it's becoming quite clear, actually. And that's pretty liberating as an activist, to be able to understand the problem so you can run at it in these many different ways, from Stellenbosch to New York City, where I live. Um, and we are trying, in the US, we are trying to influence the outcome of the next election. Mm -hmm. It will be the, for us the first time we've done that. So wish us luck. <laughs> focus on universities. Um, so thank you for asking. But since we're at a university, I'm talking mostly about that. But we also work on projects. And actually, right now, with the divestment campaign here, we're focusing on NEDBEC. And I'll say a few words, and then if you want to speak specifically to that, very all. Um, so divestment is very much um, a companion effort to work on particular projects and also trying to push governments. And part of the why 350 works the way it does is we very much work with other organizations. So we look at the whole landscape of what's happening. 
and we see, okay, you have Earth Life over here focusing on this part, you have WWF over here focusing on this part. You know, what can we do to add? So our strategy is very much trying to recognize, we're all trying to do something about this, but what can be our distinct contribution? Um, so that's a little bit about why we focus the way that we do. Um, but I think even on a bigger picture, what you're asking is a really big question for us. We're posing this all the time. Is, is what is that balance between being global and speaking with a unified global voice and being specific enough in a particular place for anyone to even be interested in what you're talking about? You know, so it's, it's not easy. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've fumbled along the way, but um, we, try and, we try and kind of walk that balance as best we can um, because our purpose is really about growing the movement. Uh, so do you want to talk no, about it? Okay. Okay. But the Ned Bank campaign is going well. We were at their annual general meeting yesterday asking them obnoxious questions. <laughs> Good questions. Good. Just to them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come on. So I was going to add something. No, no. Um, I just want to add to, to the question he's asking about um, this happening at the university yeah, yeah. and how this works with what government does. I think historically, universities have always been that place where new idea, ideas, narratives, discourses are produced as, as the center of knowledge production. What happens here influences much of what happens in, in the larger part of society. And there's no question about the fact that in this group, there sits quite a large pool of thought that will influence where we go back to. So it's more like seeing students in the academy as part of the community, as part of the country, which can impact on what people say. So whether or not the government takes us seriously now, the point is that we are bringing this message to them and saying, as people who will be future leaders or people who are leading in our own right currently, this is what we say. This is what we're saying about the current discourse to say it can't go on like this. So I just wanted to, to, to look at that power of the, of the academy yeah. in the like the society. Um, hi, uh, sorry. One of the things I wanted to ask you so serious, you're like, well, I have to do something with all these options. So I think a few things. One, you have to do what's going to work for you. I mean, what's important is being active. And so if you're setting the economy and you want to start setting how that connects to climate change and that's your avenue of activism, fabulous. If you're, you know, like me, you're, you know, you want, to be a, you want to be an activist at university most of all, so you find the group that's doing it, that was my path in wasn't because I said I was so concerned about climate change. It was I wanted to be part of this movement. So, so don't be too hard on yourself if it, feels, if it feels like you can't find the perfect thing, because there is no perfect thing. I think the important thing is to do something. Um, and that's actually what builds movement, is enough people saying, OK, I'm going to do my part, and I'm going to understand that my part is connected to these other, other parts. Um, and this sounds self-serving, and it, it, it isn't meant to be, but that is very much our approach. So it, I hope that if you guys do get involved with the work we're trying to do here, that will be your experience. Is 350 is very much a connecting point. Um, we're not trying to create 
the new mega environmental organization. We're trying to be a hub for climate activism that connects movements around. So if, if you, depending on what your entry point is, um, what interests you about climate change, ideally you can express that through your work with us. Because we, that's, that's very much the model we tried to adopt because we were seven students and we didn't have a lot to offer people. So we offered connections to others and that was how the movement grew. May I add a slide? Yes, please. And I think that was a very good question. Um, if we look at, and, and, and uh, you're saying UDM, but I'm assuming you mean UDF. Sorry, UDF, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, because UDM that, was part of Alyssa's party. party. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I was like, okay. Then you got me back with the MDM. And <laughs> so, um, as many people would know, the UDF worked very much like that. There were different discourses in, with, under that umbrella. So, by the way, I'm a child of the 80s, so it's, I, I, I look younger, but yeah, so I, <laughs> so I have Don't been there. Be it's not, I start from my reading, it's not theoretical, I was there. So, um, so and, and it, the UDF encompassed, you know, it was a range of, of organizations from residents associations, tax, you know, rates, rates and taxes, all of the unions, all of that fell under that broad umbrella and came from very different perspectives. Yes. And that is, and that is something that, you know, we're looking at in terms of the climate change movement where there's different movements, and we need to connect those movements. So in South Africa, you've got the Right to Know campaign, which is a movement, and it's looking at access to information. But how does that link to climate change? Directly, it's about access to basic information in terms of, so for example, on the nuclear issue, the nuclear power issue. Mm -hmm. It's such a secret, closed thing that we're using access to information avenues, and we, we're working with that movement to further that goal. So there are different avenues, and different movements have different kind of skills. So I think what we get, we get sucked in sometimes where we think there's one movement, and we must create one movement, and that's how we move forward. That's not going to work. We've got to look at the different strengths of the different movements. The, the problem is when you have, com you must, it mustn't be a point of and one of the strengths you might have seen with the PCM. Uh, People's Climate March. The People's Climate March where they had over 400,000 people marching. But it wasn't just young climate activists. It was, and it wasn't just NGOs that, you know, it was, you had LBGTI movements, you had unions. It was a range of people and that's what added to the numbers. So we need to look beyond that where climate change, and I'm sorry taking some of the space, but. If we look at climate change, one of the issues we're going to have to argue, and one of the things we're trying to write at 350 Africa, is the issue about xenophobia. Mm -hmm. um, we need to deal with that because when I was a student, one of the first, uh, it was actually when the UNFCCC was just going to start out. And one of the things I heard a lecturer as well say was talking about the fact that you're going to have um, climate refugees and you're going to have resource wars. And I thought, this is nonsense. You know, we were coming out of 1990, Nelson Mandela was released, we were in euphoria. <laughs> and we thought, oh gosh, more doom and gloom, I can't do this. Um, but I'm living it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing uh, climate refugees, and we're going to be dealing with more of that, and, and, and I'm seeing resource wars. In Kenya, we did a visit a few years ago to Lake Turkana. Fishermen are fishing with a rifle. I mean, not using the rifle, <laughs> they fish. <laughs> and they walk around with rifles to protect their catch. Now that's where we're at, and that's real, and it's gonna be more of that. I have some one last question. Uh, okay, uh, two then, <laughs> Yanni and then. Oh, this thing, okay, great, so Yanni can start. <laughs> I just wanna ask, are there any specific companies or organizations in the country that are looking at divesting or that have, for instance, started by making available the amount of funds that they have invested mm -hmm. in fossil fuels. Um, and any, anything concrete, anything to latch on to? Thank you, yeah. Um, it's really just getting going. So we don't have as many examples as we would like, but do you guys have some you want to offer? No, I mean, I think as made, we've just started the campaign in terms of targeting corporates and private funding. And our first target of is NetBank. 
So Nedbank claims to be the only green bank in Africa. Uh, they also talk about a zero emissions uh, bank, but really they're talking internally. They're funding almost, we know of, one billion rand of fossil fuels. We've been asking them to disclose what other investments they have in fossil fuels and what future investments they have in fossil fuels, and they're not giving it to us. But they're very easy to tell us how much they, they, they're doing in renewable energy. So that's our ongoing campaign. If anyone's interested, we can talk about that more. And that reminds me also of what Ferrell was saying. Something really interesting, or I thought it was interesting, from earlier this morning we learned is that there is a lot of investment in renew the renewable energy sector in South Africa, but most of it is not coming from South Africa. It's coming from outside. So there is this opportunity to actually divest and invest in the alternative right here and actually create economic development. So it does seem like an exciting time to be starting this conversation. It seems like there's a lot that's uh, bubbling up. Okay, we can take both questions. I've kind of got a follow-up question on also what you just answered. The international companies that have already divested, uh, like The Guardian the other day, I think a month ago they started divesting. What specifically do they actually divest and what do they invest yeah. now? Because of course, I mean, they wouldn't do it if it wasn't profitable. Right. And what do they invest in? And has, do you have any evidence yet in the past year that what they invested, if they invest mainly right. in renewables, that that actually enhances research, that that promotes research in the topic, and, and that will actually bring about a bigger, not revolution, but, but yeah. more production of renewable energy. So does it have that other effect? Really, really good question. Um, so <coughs> the short answer is it's mixed. So our, our ask to any institution that is divesting is to say, we want you to wind down your investments in fossil fuels over five years, and that's defined as 200 international companies that have a stake in fossil fuels, so coal, oil, and gas. So we call them the top 200. A and then the second part of the ask is, do not commit any new investments in fossil fuels. Um, and then the, the, the corollary is, where do you put the money once you've divested it? And so what's been very interesting to us is that you know we're primarily pushing on the demand side, and there's a metaphor that someone told me once about tree shakers and jam makers. Mm -hmm. So we're over here shaking the tree, saying, divest, divest. There's people who are making the jam, which is, here's an alternative financial product you could put your money in that's so in solar or green buildings, or I've heard some really interesting work on sustainable water and sewage for cities. All these things you could invest in that actually generate more returns and don't make the problem worse. Because if, pe if people are just moving their money from fossil fuels to guns, for example, mm -hmm. it's not really making the kind of better world that we're all excited to have. Mm -hmm. um, so it is important to have, on the one hand, sort of the stick, on the other hand, the carrot of the renewable investment. Um, since we've been here, uh, we're learning lots about, the, it seems like there's, again, a lot bubbling up in terms of these alternative investments. Um, but it's a bit of a, you'll find this as you pursue divestment with your university, it's a bit of a dance because the administration will say, well, we can't divest until we know where to put the money, which isn't really the case. <laughs> they could commit to divest and also start that research. So it's, it's, it's the sort of political piece where, yes, we need the alternatives and we need those commitments. Um, the last thing I'll say is if you do want to get more technical, there, there is a nice compilation of some of these resources at this website called Divest Invest, um, which is aiming to be a bit of a repository for um, the more technical points about if you want to move your money, where do you put it? Um, and just to sort of reinforce something, you know, it, it's, it's key to remember that this really is a political strategy, first and foremost. We absolutely want there to be divestments. What we really want is for the fossil fuel industry's ability to jeopardize our politics to be mm. changed. Because um, what we want is governments to tackle climate change. We want laws that make it illegal to cause climate change. But we don't believe we'll get that if the fossil fuel industry has all this power. So that, that really, just to sort of reinforce, um, divestment helps us do that better is in many ways the big, the big prize. 
you kind of answered my question now, but also um, your strategy is in the first world, the developed world, where um, all those most of those investments take place. Um, but in the developing world, in South Africa, a country like South Africa, again, being green is also a yucky thing because um, only you know, only rich people can really afford solar and all those kind of things. So, do you think you, if the movement takes off here, that it should? have a different kind of message than the disinvestment? Or? Totally, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very good point. And I think what's key that I've been learning since I've been here is that this call to get off of coal is not just coming from me, from the US. It's coming from communities living near coal plants here. And, and we're very much hearing from organizations and people's movements who are trying to fight coal mining, saying, this coal plant is actually making our water dirty. It's making us sick. It's making our children sick. We want something better. So it's, it's, that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is there is a different development pathway that actually has to be charted, which is, and it's much more credible now than it was even last year, where solar energy, wind energy, are actually becoming more viable and cheaper than coal. Um, and you, you might have less load shedding if you were on solar. I don't know. <laughs> but. Um, but that's also critical to the debate. And I do think um, it, when we were starting even in 2009, people were saying, you know, we were saying, well, renewable energy, it's out there, it's a real alternative. It, and it was kind of true, but it's really, it's really true now in terms of the cost being on par with fossils. And so you can actually speak truthfully about a development pathway for a resource-rich country like this one that doesn't rely on polluting energy sources. Um, I don't really don't want to cut this short because it's <laughs> extremely interesting. But I think we should, um, just for the sake of time, um, I don't know how your time is, if you can stick around. Um, so maybe ask your questions to May now, um, while we finish the last of the food, and then Stephen mm -hmm. will just say a few things. Okay, so I won't keep you long. I think you've heard a lot and you've digested a lot. Uh, but first of all, I just wanted to say thank you both for speaking today. Um, I think you've... Cool. Uh, yeah, you very friendly. Thank you. Um, because I've just learned there's a lot of copper in the, the water pipe, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's what's been going on. <laughs> uh, so we started a group on campus called Fossil Free Stellenbosch. Mm. Um, and Emily's been very kind and the uh, Leadership Institute in organizing this today. Um, our group is new. Uh, there's only a few of us, five or six, depending on who's got an assignment due tomorrow. <laughs> 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 but we'd like to build it because um, the sense of urgency is becoming stronger every month and day and week. Um, and if you're like me, you probably believe that uh, this issue was being tackled uh, in our meetings in Paris or Brussels or wherever it's happening. But it's not. Um, and I think we need to shift our understanding of that, um, that our government and our political body are not taking care of this issue. So we need to. Um, so I'm just going to direct you to the page, uh, which is Fossil Free Stellenbosch can just type that into a Facebook search and you'll find us there um, and you're welcome to join us. We'd like to build momentum to ask the university next semester to, um, to commit to divestment. Um, <laughs> but there needs to be enough of us and there needs to be a groundswell. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And if you have questions afterwards, you're welcome to grab a snack and ask any, any uh, of the 350 group that's come down. And once again, thanks very much uh, for speaking. Yeah. And yeah, thanks.